Hello everyone, I'm John Dolman. I'm the Executive Director at the uh, Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine. Welcome to the latest presentation in our Total Recovery Lecture Series, Beyond Mindfulness, the Emerging, Emerging Science of Consciousness. The um, practice of meditation has been integral at the Kaplan Center for patients and staff since Dr. Kaplan first uh, conceived his model of an integrative medical practice. Tonight's speaker is Laura Paris. Laura is our mindfulness meditation instructor. She received her uh, professional training at mindfulness-based stress reduction through John Cabot Zinn's stress clinic at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. Laura also received her master's in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, where she explored the intersection of contemplative practice and healing in partnership with Harvard Medical School. Laura is also an affiliate teacher with the Insight Mind Meditation Community of Washington. At the Kaplan Center, Laura sees patients for one-on-one -on -one meditation and yoga therapy healing sessions. She also teaches a series of meditation classes at the center and leads a uh, weekly drop-in class every Wednesday night. Uh, please welcome Laura Paris. All right. Can you hear me okay? Mic is on? Great. Welcome, each of you. I'm so, so happy that this evening is here. Been really looking forward to it. So glad you're here. Uh, I wanted to start off tonight with an invitation, really, for all of us to approach the material that I present with a real um, fun feeling of exploration. The whole point of tonight is really an exploration through the potential of our minds and our hearts. And inherent in that, it's a little bit unknown. This is, again, a very emerging science. So the best way for all of us to benefit the most tonight is really to come and listen from a state of discovery rather than a state of conclusion. So usually, for most of us, um, whenever we're talking or listening, we tend to listen in a way that we're sort of confirming our own experience in some way. We're listening for what resonates with what we already think or believe, or we're ready to sort of pounce and oppose. Um, so see what it feels like tonight to just be very open, really relaxed, and what in Zen is called beginner's mind, so a real presence of um, not knowing. And um, we'll see where we go. So the takeaways for tonight, I'm starting at the end for all of you. So this is the main things that I'd like you to be leaving with tonight. Your mind, immensely powerful tool. And we all hear that a lot more and more these days. It's a matter of put it in, putting it into practice and making it our own felt experience. And that's where the real magic happens. So I'm hoping to empower each of you and inspire you to do that tonight. Uh, in a universe of infinitely complex interconnection, Nothing happens in isolation, and everything affects the whole. And in this interconnected universe, it is possible to harness the power of your mind and heart in order to affect positive change in your health, in your life, and in your world. Those are very big ideas, but I'm hoping to chop off just a little bit, little bit of that tonight. So I came across this Zen greeting card, not thinking of you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reason why I wanted to post this is uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I chose to call this lecture Beyond Meditation or Beyond Mindfulness. And this points to the popularity of meditation these days, right? It's kind of everywhere. There's Mindful Magazine. There's uh, a book coming out, The Mindful CEO, which is wonderful. It's great that it's more and more out there. Um, the danger, as I think we all know with anything that gets really more popular, is that it can lose some of its depth. And um, while it's wonderful that meditation and mindfulness has taken off so much, and I'm going to be discussing that a little bit, um, it can sort of become something, if we're not careful, that we're kind of squeezing into our life the way we're taking our omega-3 fatty acids and getting in our workout and trying to be compassionate, all of those things, it can become another sort of check the box very easily if we're not careful. Um, so I really wanted to speak to that tonight. Uh, that said, um, 
and I w had wanted to make this point as well, there is a tendency to sort of focus more on what I like to call the side effects of meditation more than the potential of meditation. Metent meditation has a potential to offer us so much. And while the techniques that we're learning are very, very valuable, it can be nice to hold those techniques in a little bit of a greater perspective. Uh, that said, especially for those of you who might be really new to meditation, I wanted to offer a couple of studies that show the power of meditation and mindfulness, um, simply the power of the mind's effect on the body. Uh, I did want to introduce that to you. Um, there are three studies I'm going to be sharing. Uh, the first one was conducted, um, they're actually a combination of two studies that were conducted by Sarah Lazar at Harvard Medical School. And she found that meditators, there are actual structures in the brain that increase in size through the practice of meditation, actual structurally. So the same way we lift a bicep, we lift a weight and build our bicep, we can literally, we're changing the structure of our brain. These are some of the details, increased in size um, areas having to do with mind wandering, self-relevance, learning, cognition, memory, emotional regulation, perspective, empathy, and compassion, and the production of regulatory neurotransmitters. Um, so much, we're learning so much of health has to do with the balance of hormones and neurotransmitter um, balance in the brain. And Dr. Gary does tons of work with that at the clinic. Um, what's interesting, what decreased in size? The amygdala, which is where we feel that primal fight or flight instinct actually decreased in size. That's our most sort of primitive brain. It's been designed to keep us alive. Unfortunately, now that we have a lot of low-grade stresses, the, the saber-toothed tiger isn't necessarily chasing us anymore. So that burst of adrenaline doesn't really serve a purpose, and it tends to be constant over time. So calming down that amygdala is very, very important, and meditation has proven effective in that. Also, look at this poor monk getting all hooked up. There, was, there have been several studies, actually, that actually show that it's possible to control previously thought unconscious um, physical responses. So this study was done at, also at Harvard Medical School. Traditionally, actually, originally, this study was done in the Himalayas on site with some Tibetan monks in 1979. Um, Herbert Benson up at uh, Harvard Medical School, you know, everyone thought he was crazy. And he did this study that showed that these Tibetan advanced practitioners have the ability to increase their body temperature. And sure enough, the snow around them melted. And these wet uh, towels that were freezing because they were up in the mountains started steaming. Folks didn't really believe him. He had gotten permission actually from the Dalai Lama to conduct that experiment. Um, came back to Harvard, and they did a more controlled study. So they regulated the temperature in the room, et cetera. And this is what they found. They entered a steep, uh, state of deep meditation. Freezing wet sheets were placed over their shoulders. Steam rose from these sheets. And they were actually able to increase the temperature of their extremities by up to 15%. Really extraordinary, right? We tend to think of things like body temperatures entirely beyond our, our conscious control. Uh, and they were required in this experiment to do it three times. One time wasn't enough. They had to dry three sheets, separate occasions. Another study, uh, the last mindfulness meditation study I'm going to uh, introduce, um, took place um, by John Kabat-Zinn. He created the experiment. Um, many of you have probably heard of him. He's sort of the father of mindfulness in the context of healthcare in our country. Um, I was fortunate to study with him. And he conducted an experiment ages ago, but this was back, I think, in 1998. But it's such a um, seminal study, I wanted to include it. Two groups of um, psoriasis patients went in to get their phototherapy, very, very standard therapy for psoriasis. One of them, one group, the control group, simply received the training, the um, treatment. And the second group was listening to a mindfulness CD and was focusing on the sensation in their arm. I think most of the um, uh, participants had uh, lesions on their arm. The lesions of the treatment group healed four times faster. Four times faster. You know, it's really, some of these things, it's important to kind of really let it settle. That's really something. 
So we're about to make a little transition here. So again, it's very, very valuable to go over the techniques of mindfulness and meditation. It's very important to practice, certainly not um, diminishing that in any way. But there's, again, there's a potential to overlook some of what meditation can offer us that's on an even deeper level. So the potential of meditation versus what I'm calling the side effects of meditation. The potential of meditation, folks who have experienced really deep states of meditation, um, they describe very, very similar experiences. Feelings of oneness, feelings of very, very deep peace, feelings of interconnectedness and also feelings of increased intuition. And those are through the millennia, really. Folks have been experiencing that. I mean, there are more and more studies, actually, in the last maybe 20 or 30 years describing that as well in other meditative traditions other than mindfulness. Um, but sometimes the way we're, we've been focusing is a little bit like the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. Has anyone heard of that from the Buddha? Um, pointed out the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. So the finger is the technique and some of the basic side effects, which are great. Um, the moon, I'm arguing here, is this understanding of the interconnectedness of the universe, really, and consciousness's role in that. So that's what we're going to be exploring for the rest of the evening. Um, and I'm, I say here, consciousness research is beginning to confirm that the subjective experience of folks in deep meditation could be an objective reality. So we're living at very, very interesting times. Um, the quick physics lesson is going to be very quick. You'll all be very happy and grateful to know. Um, but in a very, I just want to go over just a very, very general, general shift in perspective that's happened in the scientific community over the past um, couple centuries, but particularly now, or the um, past century especially. Um, the Newtonian worldview really held that matter was solid and fixed and predictable and responded to certain laws of motion in a very predictable way. The model is similar to matter as machine. Similar in a sense, people equate Newton with Descartes a lot. I think, therefore, I am. That sense of um, cognitive understanding in particular in terms of looking at concrete, separate entities in matter. The quantum worldview, since Einstein and Heisenberg and um, incredible scientists, show that matter is actually interconnected, malleable. Rather than predictable, it's constantly in a state of pure potentiality in which infinite possibilities could arise. It's, our cognitive minds can't even comprehend that. Uh, so it's more of a model of matter as energy. So it's much more focused on an energetic relationship. Because the model of the universe espoused by quantum physics is based on interconnection, this new physics is informing consciousness studies in a big way. 